hours after his arrest by Punjab police, BJP leader Tejinder Bagga returns to the national capital. Arrest sparks political face-off between BJP and Ahmadmi Party. Haryana Chief Minister ML Khattar says procedure was not followed. As states grapple with massive power fronts, government asks states to import coal. 13 power plants that operate on imported coal ask to operate and generate power to their full capacity. MK Stalin wants Chennai custodial death case to be treated as murder, directs CBCID to book the cops, while the National SCST Commission recommends suspension and arrest of five police officers. NHRC sends notice to the government of Telangana over the reported killing of a Dalit man for his interfaith marriage in Hyderabad. The National Commission for Scheduled Cars also takes full motor cognizance of the case. Rahul Gandhi takes on KCR in his bastion. Telangana claims Congress to return to power in the state. National Family Health Survey data says fertility rate of India has also declined. Also shares dismal stats that 35% of men in India still think the onus is on women when it comes to contraception. Very good evening. You're watching Beyond the Headline. I'm Tamanna Inamdar. The least the dead deserve is to be counted. We're now in a much better place as a nation as far as COVID-19 is concerned. Most adults are vaccinated and fears of a fourth wave are tempered. But there is no denying that lakhs of Indians have suffered, especially in 2020 and 2021. The question is, how many have died because of the pandemic? Now, this is not merely an academic question. The data is important because it helps governments make decisions with regards to robustness of the healthcare system and prepare for a possible future health crisis. Here is where it gets tricky. Now, yesterday we reported that the World Health Organization says over 47 lakh Indians have died in 2020 and 2021 due to COVID-19. The claim has been met with angry rebuttals from the Indian government whose official figure till May 2022 is a little over 5.2 lakhs. Now, this is a vast gap and has turned into a political issue as well. It's important to understand why there is such a big difference. Either the WHO is terribly wrong or the government is greatly undercounting the dead. Let's delve in a little deeper. The WHO has said in its report that an estimated 1.5 crore people all over the world are likely to have died due to the direct or indirect impact of the disease. This is nearly three times the 54 lakh official deaths that all countries have reported. In India, the gap is much larger between WHO estimates and official estimates, nearly 10 times. The health ministry's view is, and I quote, in view of the availability of authentic data published through the civil registration system, that's the CRS, by the Registrar General of India, mathematical models should not be used for projecting excess mortality numbers for India. This CRS data, by the way, has come in just the day before yesterday. So how did the WHO arrive at this figure? The WHO website uses the yardstick of excess mortality. So as per the report, excess mortality is the difference between the number of deaths that have occurred and the number of deaths that would have taken place if there was no pandemic. They have based this on death data from earlier years to figure out the extra deaths. The second crucial factor to understand is that the WHO is talking about deaths associated with COVID-19 directly as well as indirectly. That means people who have died because they had COVID-19 and also people who had other health conditions and were unable to access healthcare since the system was overburdened and dealing with COVID. For example, someone suffering from cancer or someone who needs dialysis and could not go to the hospitals because they were overburdened or flooded with COVID-19 patients and perhaps died because of a lack of care. A third factor that has been considered and adjusted by the WHO in its method is that deaths due to instances like accidents or motor vehicle accidents would have been reduced in the pandemic years 
because of lockdowns. And this means that more people have possibly died due to COVID-related reasons. Now, let's look at how India identifies COVID deaths. After an intervention of the Supreme Court, the government clarified that deaths occurring within 30 days from the date of testing or from the date of being clinically determined as a COVID-19 case will be treated as deaths due to COVID-19, even if that death takes place outside the hospital or in an inpatient facility. Some believe this is also a fairly broad definition. Moreover, India has a well-established and robust system of counting deaths, but are the COVID deaths being counted correctly? Another point to note, even though all the headlines are on the WHO numbers, there is a report the Lancet has put out on April 16th that estimated excessive COVID deaths in India at a little over 40 lakhs. So who is right and who is wrong? To speak on this, I'm joined now by Dr. Koshal Kant Mishra, spokesperson for the BJP, Dr. N.K. Mehra, immunologist and former dean of Ames Delhi, Dr. S.S. Lal, public health expert and president of the All India Professional Congress Kerala Unit, and Dr. Ramanan Lakshmi Narayanan, professor at Princeton University. Welcome to all of you and thank you so much for speaking with us today. Let me go across to Dr. Mishra first for his opening comments because the question, Dr. Mishra, is of credibility. The Indian government today is saying that the WHO figures are essentially not credible, that they are vastly overestimating how many people have died in the country due to COVID-19. Why do you think the WHO would do this? We can't say why the WHO is doing this, but the method adopted by WHO is statistically unsound and scientifically very questionable. In our country, there is a variation. There are different, different states. The WHO initial problem was the, this, that the, uh, there are, uh, WHO has divided in tiers, tier 1, tier 2, and tier 3 uh, type of country. And they put India in the tier 2 country where they don't rely on the data provided by the government in spite of at least 10 communication given between 20 to 21, uh, around at least uh, more than 10 communication to the WHO. In spite that they, why they have kept it uh, in tier 2 city, we don't know. And if they are keeping in tier 2 city, it means they are not relying on the government data. They are taking data from the media, they are taking data from the social website, they are taking data from the web portal and RTI information. It means they are primarily not taking the authentic data whatsoever is available from the government. And this is, the, this is in my opinion, the biggest problem. In spite of our government is ready to give all the data whatsoever is available in our country related to the mortality in COVID. And you yourself have said that the, the, the definition uh, given by the government of India regarding the what is a COVID debt is quite broad. And one more thing I want to say that the Supreme Court has ordered if anybody has claimed that his family member is died of COVID and the government should give at least 50,000 rupees, it is a Supreme Court. This means every public is open if anybody has All got right. some uh, family member died with the COVID. But Dr. Mishra, just a couple of things. Just, just, just a couple of things before I open the floor. Uh, from your opening statement, just a couple of things. You said there have been at least 10 communications from the government of India to WHO, and that is absolutely correct. But are all of those t 10 communications giving data? Because to my understanding, the CRS data has come a couple of days ago. And the exact number of 5,23,000 odd has also <laughs> come this week. Secondly, isn't it also true that in several states, the number of claims for deaths due to COVID-19 are exceeding the official figure that state has put out of the number of people who've died that indicates that there could be an undercount? There are different, different states in the country and there are different phases of the lockdown in our country. So we cannot put the same criteria and your question that all the 10 communication is related to the COVID number. Uh, th uh, this particular information is truly not available to me. Mm -hmm. So I can't comment on this, but this shows that we are directly in contact with the WHO. We are open for all the discussion. Okay. Even the WHO has uh, many times appreciated our the management of, of uh, COVID in country. And one more thing, one last thing that India, they have taken temperature and mortality, COVID-related mortality, inversely to each other, which is not true in our country. This is one thing. Another thing, in our country, except for the first lockdown, the second wave 
uh, you have seen the state by state, location by location, the lockdown changes and the modality of test is also changes. WHO has strongly taken the uh, uh, view of uh, considering uh, RT-PCR as well as antigen equally, which is not true in our country. There are different phases where the different type of test uh, modality has been de uh, derived right. by the government and it varies from one state to other. So our country is very variable. So putting a, a single type of yardstick for the, all the states right. at the one time, it's uh, scientifically... Okay. Uh, non, um, but but uh, by the extension of that logic, and let me bring in Dr. Lal here, by the extension of that logic, if the country is very variable and there are different yardsticks, then that makes it difficult for us to also count the number of deaths accurately. We have the same problem then. And how do we know our numbers are accurate? Dr. Lal, I want you to come in on this. So this is the issue. First of all, this should not be considered as a an issue of pride, you no, know, somebody questioning our pride or patriotism, nothing like that. Let us talk science. Let us be in the reality. See, whenever uh, the disease surveillance or this kind of information, uh, when we discuss such things, you know, we, have, we know the de uh, developing world has a problem, big problem. And India has a big issue. See, we know that you know, the reports will not reflect the reality in India, whatever be the case, whether it is health or whatever. So that's a reality. And we have not adjusted for that number. See, these numbers are coming from the governments or the reporting, the available reporting mechanism. It's actually the reporting mechanisms are improving day by day, but we have a lot of difficulties, a lot of issues. And I'm from a state where data management is very good, but we had the issue of manipulating the data. So these things happen. So either deliberately or by mistake, data will be lost from different parts of the country because it's such a huge country, very complex country. So that's a reality. So I'm not saying that the figure counted by the WHO is the final figure, but there should be negotiation. The WHO is not an outside body. WHO has an office no, in India. No, but Dr. Lal, what do you mean the, by negotiation? I have worked. What, what do you mean by so negotiation? Either the WHO is right or the WHO is wrong. See, Either the Indian government's come, data is right let, or it's wrong. Let me, no, 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 no. Let, let me explain it. Let me explain it. See, until recently, WHO was estimating the number of TB cases in India, tuberculosis. We didn't have any estimates. We did not have, just recently we concluded a prevalence survey. So we don't have any numbers. So WHO was estimating. Then we will say that, no, this is not the number, this could be less or this kind of. So that's how. So if, when you don't have direct evidence, WHO will come with estimates. And the country will try to say that oh, this is this was wrong or this went wrong somewhere. This that's what I meant by negotiation. It's not the negotiation numbers just because we want to raise the numbers. So that's what I said. So okay. see, and when it comes to diseases like this is spread through air or this kind of infectious diseases, we have a high burden. Twenty five percent of global TB is in India. Right. And India ranks third in the in terms of the number of HIV cases. So we have last number of cases. We cannot deny it. It's not our fault. That's the reality. We have population, we have social... No, no, but I, th I, think, I think we're we digressing. We're we speaking very specifically about in... scientific assessment of how many people died due to COVID-19. And it's an emotive issue, it's a political issue, but it's an important issue because yeah. we should know so that we can prepare for what is coming next. You have quotes from Bill Gates today everywhere saying that the next pandemic is not going to be 100 years later, probably in the next 20 years. Are our systems in place? That is the issue at root here. Dr. Mehra, now, can you come in on why there has been such a robust and strong rebuttal of the WHO's claim, especially when you see it in light of what Lancet has also said just a few days ago. Yeah, the Lancet has said, but you know, if you look at the dashboard of various countries, for example, John Hopkins has been a very strong dashboard. And if, even that, if you see today, it continues to say the same numbers as they. WHO seems to have erred somewhere. I don't believe that the numbers of deaths in India could be 10 times more. If you look at the number of deaths, you know, the death rate, the total death rate during the first wave, second wave, and the third wave has consistently been lowest in India. It has always been 1.2, even during the Delta wave. How come, uh, you know, the WHO is based their data probably on estimates, and estimations can go wrong. They base their data on the mathematical calculations. And we have seen during the pandemic a number of mathematical 
modeling scheme. And not everyone was right, actually, you know. So I think these are all based on estimates. While the numbers that the country has put up on CRS, we have a very robust CRS system in India, you know, and that we have uh, tested and tried for the last several years. Yes. I, I fail to understand why WH has not looked into the CRS data. And they've gone into estimations and modeling. I, I really fail to understand. Is it there could be some change in the number? If they had come up and said, well, your numbers are 1.5 times more than you have said. To say this is a 10 times more, and this can happen with any country, you know, even the US, the the, the, the Western right. countries, you would say, also... No, no, everyone's, everyone's data has been, been questioned by the WHO. Make no mistake, worldwide, the WHO's overall figure is 1.5 crores. That is three times what everyone's official data combined of all nations is. So this is not an Indian problem, but in India, it's become political. That's a different issue. We need to figure out whether we have counted correctly. Dr. Ramanan, now, the question is of the methodology that WHO has utilized, where they've also talked about indirect deaths due to COVID-19. Do you think it is correct to add that data point in when counting the impact of the pandemic? Amanda, let me first start with some basic facts. And sometimes, you know, everything, everyone's entitled to their opinion, but not entitled to their facts. In India, only 20% of medical deaths are, uh, or deaths are medically certified. To say that we have a robust civil registration system is simply not correct. And this is true at all times. This is true across governments. And the first thing is, that is actually a fact. The second is that governments around the world have, you know, do tend to question, you know, WHO's estimates on these deaths because, you know, nobody wants to be seen as having more deaths. So this is not an India-specific problem, nor is it actually a this government-specific problem. We've had this problem with undercounting of deaths from malaria 20 years ago. Same issue has existed for a very long time. The third issue is that excess mortality is an accepted method. By just throwing a dart at it, saying it's mathematical model, therefore it's wrong, is not correct. It reflects an, you know, an ignorance about what these methods really are. Excess mortality says, if typically in a place you will only have 1,000 deaths you know, a year, but suddenly in one particular year you have 5,000 deaths, then those 4,000 deaths are somehow due to this new situation, which could be COVID. Now, it goes both ways. What we found was that, in fact, during the first wave of COVID, excess deaths actually were lower. In other words, there were fewer deaths, particularly in poorer populations, during the lockdown because there were fewer deaths because of homicides, because of suicide, because of injuries, road traffic accidents. So, in fact, the lockdown helped not just with respect to COVID, but also other people who didn't die because the lockdown was in place. So that is also included. What is also included is perhaps that some additional people died because they were not able to access healthcare, which is as a result of the COVID pandemic. So it is correct that the excess mortality actually just gives you a situation of how things were different in the last two years compared to what you would have expected in a specific normal year. And this is absolutely the right method. And the last thing I conclude with is by saying, let's not just attack WHO and these as WHO estimates. There have been five other estimates by different groups around the world, many working with civil registration systems, including ours. We had a paper in The Lancet as well, five months ago, which all show a fairly consistent number of somewhere between three, three and a half million deaths and about six, six and a half million deaths. Now, I know that's a very wide range, but all that I'm trying to say is that this is not one group, one entity. People using multiple methods have arrived at the same conclusion, which is that the, the deaths due to COVID were probably in that range of three and a half to six and a half million deaths, which is, you know, to contrast it, lacks about 35 to 60 lakhs. We don't know exactly where it is, but the answer is definitely not 500,000. The reported deaths, whether Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins only reports what countries report based on tested, COVID-tested patients. Okay. Many people never got a COVID test before they died. And so that is not an accurate number, not for India, not for any other country. But just like Dr. Lal said, I would urge us to take this out of this political argument space, which is not helpful, and put it in the perspective of science. And I think scientists who work on this are unanimous that this is roughly the range that the deaths are. And it is neither shame for India. I think if you see it as a percentage of the population, it's a fairly small percentage of the population, 
And it is, you know, it just reflects the fact that we're a large country, we're a poor country, and we have our challenges. Dr. You know, Mishra, we can't be suddenly expected to pull something out of a hat. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Mishra, you know, I, I want to come to that point. Why is it becoming a political issue? Why are um, the WHO numbers or other estimates seen as a criticism of India or like a question on what the central government has done vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19? There are many good things, there are many things that could have been done better. Why is it being painted as something that has been going wrong. And the problem with that is, then you tend not to look at the true picture. Don't you think that's an issue? No, 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 no. We, we, we are going through all the data. You know, right now, the as per law, all the deaths as well as all the births should be registered. And it is on the document. And I, I, I agree with the other fellows that, yes, our mechanism may not be so robust. But these mechanisms are not robust in the poor area, village area, where the COVID crisis is very less, much less. We say that COVID is a disease of basically the city is not the villages and everybody migrated to right. the villages and they saved their life. So I understand the COVID, this data system may not be so strong in the villages, but it is, it is truly strong. And this, uh, your question is why it is political issue? Because if the if the uh, uh, we are the democratic country and uh, uh, every every country has got different political view, and if the, some political no, no, party no, no. My point is, is why why is it party seen party as a matter of questioning of the government but or that we did something wrong, or you know you should not say that we had more deaths than we did. No, I mean, my, my, the least these families biggest, deserve is to have their pain count for something. In my, whatever the document I have gone through, the, the, the most funny part is that the WHO has not predicted the death in China. Why? We don't know. This is a big okay. question. This puts question on the WHO itself. Because the China doesn't disclose its policies. While the country is disclosing our, all the uh, records and even then WHO is not picking up. And uh, on the on the side of China and WHO, we have got many many right. stories. It is not discussed here, but actually, our our government is very fairly trying to put forward all the death record so that we can plan in a better way. And what I, I want to take up the, the future, China, issue. China issue. I want to take up the China issue because point. that in you know everyday parlance has become the thing. That can you trust WHO? They have been siding with China. Dr. Ramanan, do you want to feel that? You know, first of all, I hope we are never like China. China is not an example for us to follow in any stretch at all. And, you know, frankly, what happens in China is of least interest to people in India. What we are concerned about here is that we have to improve a health system. We need to give due, you know, we need to acknowledge that there were deaths because both for the future, as you said, Tamanna, but also for people who died. You know, people who died need to be acknowledged. And I would really urge that we not you know, China, yes, China does tell lies. They tell lies about everything. They tell lies about their GDP. No, no, but Dr. Ramanan, the they, question they, is not whether China is lying. The question is whether WHO is fair. It's not Has WHO China, been siding with China? And hence, can see, they be the treated yes. as credible? That is the question that's see, being raised. Uh, again, let me go. You have not yet, you know, the point that I made earlier was, Forget about the fact that WHO is coming up with these estimates. I told you that there are five other yeah. published estimates in serious journals, Science, Lancet, Lancet Infection Diseases, all which have come to the same conclusion about excess mortality and number of COVID deaths in India. Let us stick with just that point. Even if you throw WHO's estimates out, you still have to answer for the fact that there are five other estimates that are saying the same thing. I don't want to get into the issue of WHO's, you know, actions with respect to China. That's a whole other discussion and, you know, origin of COVID and all of that stuff, which I think we will all be very agreed on, that there has been inadequate uh, scrutiny of China, that, you know, we cannot trust what China is saying, etc. But that is not a reason to emphasize the main point here, which is that we have, not for our fault, but just the nature of our system, we are undercounting the death. And the number that is coming up from WHO represents a consensus of what scientific experts feel. And I think we should stay with that point and not politicize it. Let's stick with the science. Yeah, so stick, stick to the science. And Dr. Mehra, let's come in on the science. The point that there are others apart from WHO who are estimating the deaths at much, much higher. Now, it brings into question whether we really know what happened between the years of 2020 and 2022 or not. 
uh, one of the claims being made on this panel is that there weren't as many cases or there weren't as many deaths from COVID-19 in the villages, in rural areas. That's what Dr. Mishra said a short while ago. Can we truly be sure of that? Because there wasn't as much testing facility either. Who knows what happened? Yeah, I don't think one can be sure of that. You know, the point is that this has been a debate from time to time even during 2020 to 2021, that even the total number of infections that we are seeing in India are actually far higher. So if, if, if you're talking in terms of the WHO saying 10 times more death rate, I think somebody will come and say that the num number of infections in India were also much higher, you know. Uh, and, and certainly it was a fact that the, during the first wave, there will be, we, we really didn't have, and that is true of m many other countries, countries as well, that the countries did not have that ability to test as many numbers as they But that ability was so much improved during the second wave in 2021. And now, of course, the number of labs that the that tests have become very high. I have personally seen the robust way of scoring this data, actually, on the website. And the laboratories have been mandated. And the laboratories were closed from time to time if they were not doing their job well. So I, I really, I'm not sure if the WHO is absolutely right in saying that the number of deaths in India have been 10 times higher. I, 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 I don't think that I could believe that because the numbers cannot go that haywire. I would be OK if the WHO said, look, I mean, you're saying 5 lakhs, uh, your number of infections. 50 lakhs, it could be double the number. Well, it could be. And okay. on the basis of the issue that you just said, that we may not be sure about the things in the rural side. No, but that's that's like even a broader estimation. Your issue, Dr. Mera, is not that the WHO is counting higher, but why this much higher? Dr. Lal, you want to come in on that? Yesterday, by the way, just to add some context, I was speaking with Dr. N.K. Aroda about this, and his point was that if I go by what the WHO is saying, then 25% of all deaths all deaths registered that took place in these two years were due to COVID-19. And that seems excessively high. Would you say there is some merit in that argument? Dr. Lal, that question's for you. See, uh, what? Would you Sorry? say there is some merit in the argument? Would you say some, there is some merit in the argument that the estimates by the WHO are excessively high? Because if you go by them, then it means that 25% of all people in India who died between 2020 and 2021 died of COVID-19. Is that believable to you? No, we don't have the data. That's a problem. So when we don't have the data, we have to depend on the available data. And we have to argue on that. And see, there is no meaning in defaming WHO or coming up with, uh, coming up with allegations against WHO. We have a solution. Our census is due. We can ask people when we have this, just add two questions. One is, did you have any death in the family between 2020 and now, when the census is being conducted? And then ask the age and sex, simple. So there is no meaning. When you don't have, when you don't know which is right, because as somebody already said, we don't. We know that our our uh, reports don't reflect the reality. That's a fact. And uh, somebody had a confusion between rates and uh, numbers. I wanted to touch upon that also. See, our rates are death rates are low. That doesn't mean that absolute numbers are low. See, one percent of India mean one percent of India population is 1.3 crores. So rates are low. Even for HIV, our rates are low. But we are the third highest in terms of number of HIV patients globally. So that confusion should not be there. And when we don't, when we cannot claim that our data is strong, our data reflects the reality, when we cannot say that, we have to depend on someone. And that's what I meant by negotiation. We have to have scientific discussions. They are, they are okay. using a methodology which is scientific. I'm going to but come there to could Dr. Be Ramanan errors. on this point. But we point. should be able to tell... Dr. Ramanan, are you ready to take the, right the WHO's thing? word at face value? and look at such a high proportion of deaths considering, as Dr. Mishra has mentioned earlier, that they themselves have based some of their estimates on um, reports that they've seen online, on RTI applications, on, uh, you know, not first-hand information. Doesn't that leave excessive room for error? 
So let me tell you about uh, our study, which was in the Lancet, which is based on Chennai death registration data, which is very robust. Chennai has a has a good death, death registration system. And we looked at all-cause mortality. Now, in France, in Italy, during the peak of their COVID waves, they had excess mortality was 60 or 70%. So normally, if they had 100 deaths, they were noticing 160, 170 deaths. In Chennai, during the second wave, we saw a four times increase in excess mortality, 400 deaths, sometimes 500 deaths. So, and also it is a mistake to think that the poor didn't die of COVID. In fact, during the lockdown, the poor were saved by the lockdown. But during the second wave, the poor were disproportionately affected by COVID. Now, I'm not extrapolating from Chennai to the entire country because that is not reasonable. But others have used a similar civil registration system data from cities where we do have good estimates and adjusting, of course, for... Uh, you know, what you might see in rural India, it is also a mistake to think that rural India was not affected by COVID. I think, you know, there is enough evidence from other ways. You know, there are always these kind of data are interpolated from various different sources. And I'm comfortable with the WHO's estimates, not because the WHO is saying it, but because four other, five other groups of scientists that I respect who are using different methods and us have all arrived at the same conclusion. Okay. So I wouldn't, I don't go at, as a scientist, I don't go at things as, Oh, gut feeling. I don't think it can be this high. Mm. There's no room for the gut in science. This is really around, this is exactly what the numbers are. And if you want a longer program to see how many, you know, deaths were actually recorded, we're using each death. We're not using some aggregate number. This actually was the reality when different groups using different data looked at this. So let us move forward from here in a productive way and say, let's leave this behind us. You know, frankly, the public is not focused on this. We need to just look at how we handle the next pandemic based on this. No, but you and know, you know, this you this know, is the point. The public yeah. may not be focused on it. I open by saying that today COVID looks like it's behind us, but yeah, exactly. people have lost their near and dear ones. They have gone through hell. The least they deserve is to be acknowledged for what happened to them. Dr. Mishra, don't you think that needs to be uh, a priority as well? when we're looking at what really has happened and what the numbers are. Yes, it... The dead deserve to be counted, sir. Yes, Tabana, it's 100% and government is trying to do so. And even the Supreme Court has ordered, I told you, that if anybody claims that his family member has died of COVID, they can approach to the government, they will get the money also. And this is, a, we can say this is a, a way how we can get more data, more transparent data. And I agree with Dr. Slal, if we can add some more, uh, if a, a, a census commissioner is ready to add this uh, issue to the next census, I think that will be a better way for planning for next pandemic. And I'm not saying that the data, which data is correct or which, but at least as an Indian, as a, as a countryman, uh, I am also a doctor and I am always on the television, on the COVID issue multiple times, and I know the reality also. But yes, we have to at least, uh, we should not throw our country's data. And yes, I agree that 10 times di difference is too much high. So I think I think uh, in near future, probably if the if uh, some more mechanism will develop, we will come to know what is the real death. All and, right. and death is, uh, even birth is registered and death is also registered. So it is a very, so, uh, very, uh, very sympathetic issue for everyone. But yes. in my opinion, you know, a debate, every death is important and our government is a proactively debate trying which to ends, collect a debate all the data which ends to help with our A debate countrymen. which ends with uh, two sides agreeing on at least something, I think is a fruitful one. So at least there's a consensus here that maybe the next census should include one point on did someone in your family die of COVID-19? because we deserve to know the truth. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us on the debate this evening. We'll take a very short break, but when we come back, the big story of the day, the dramatic arrest and rescue of Mr. Tejinder Bagga. Three police forces across three states all involved with an accusation against one man. What really happened? And the bigger question, what does this say about the functioning of the police? Do police work for politicians or do they work for us, the citizens? We're coming back with that 
after this debate, I have a very um, important guest with us, uh, Dr. Yashu, Mr. Yashuvardhan Azad, former IPS officer, joins us on the other side of the break. Don't go away. Welcome back. You're watching Beyond the Headline and undoubtedly the biggest headline of the day was all the experiences of Mr. Tajinder Singh Bagga today. The dramatic arrest and rescue of BJP's Tajinder Singh Bagga today was nothing short of a movie script. Police of three states were involved in this political showdown from Delhi to Punjab to Haryana. Three state forces swung into action over the BJP leader. Now, you can look at it as, a, as law taking its course as kidnapping, as the Delhi police says, or political vendetta. Wherever you stand on the issue, the events today have raised several questions and the biggest one of them is, do the police truly work only as an arm of political parties or do they work for the people? At the center of this controversy is Tejinder Singh Bagga. He's a BJP leader. He was first booked by the Punjab police for making provocative statements against Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal, prompting religious enmity and criminal intimidation. And this gave rise to the cat and mouse game. It all started at 5 a.m. today when the BJP leader was picked up by the Punjab police from his residence in Delhi. Bagga's father alleged his son was kidnapped, which prompted the Delhi police to register a case and swing into action. Now, while the Punjab team was on the way to Mohali, they were stopped by the Haryana police, who then surrounded the car carrying Bagga. The Haryana police then escorted him and the Punjab police team off the highway to a police station in Kurukshetra. With a search warrant in hand, a team of Delhi police reached Kurukshetra and dramatically rescued Bagga, who flashed a victory sign as he changed cars. The Delhi police then brought him back to the national capital. The matter has now reached the Punjab and Haryana High Court. Let me go across first to my colleague Bhavtosh, who gets us the latest. On Friday, high drama was witnessed in Delhi, Haryana and Punjab when the Punjab police came here in West Delhi and picked up Tejinder Bagga. The Punjab police said that they had registered an FIR against Tejinder Bagga, Delhi BJP leader, claiming that he had posted inflammatory material on social media. They had said that five summons were issued to him and they, he has been asked to join the investigation because he did not comply to these summons. They had no option but to arrest him. Tejinder Bagga's father then arrived here at Janakpuri police station and lodged a missing complaint. Delhi police immediately registered a case of abduction. Delhi police then went to Dwarka police station and asked for sur search warrants. Meanwhile, as Punjab police cavalcade was moving towards Mohali court, the cavalcade was stopped by the Haryana police claiming that they had been informed by the Delhi police that Tejinder Bagga has been kidnapped. Delhi police then informed Haryana police that the Punjab police cavalcade should be stopped because uh, they have got search warrants. After a few hours, Tejinder Bagga was released from the custody of Punjab police. The matter has now reached Punjab and Haryana High Court and the hearing will take place uh, tomorrow. Meanwhile, because of this bitter rivalry between Punjab, Haryana and Delhi police, uh, there is a lot of feud between these agencies and uh, the Delhi police had said that uh, the fire that they had lodged against unidentified persons will continue to be investigated by them. The Punjab police on its part have said that they had informed the Delhi police about developments that have taken place in this case and probably for this very reason they had no option but to arrest Tej uh, Tejinder Bagga. The Haryana police on its part now claim that Delhi police had informed them about the fact that Tejinder Bagga has been kidnapped and they had no option but to stop the car that was moving from Delhi towards Kurukshetra. All right, so the important thing to understand here is that the police in any state report to the home ministry of that state government. In Delhi, the police report to the central Home Ministry. And the whole case now smacks of police officers working on the instructions or the political desires of these respecting respective reportive powers. And that's where the problem really is. If you ask me, the true story and the true problem is, should the police be not acting independently? Yashuvardhan Azad, a former IPS officer, joins us on the show for more on this. Mr. Azad, thank you so much for speaking with us. You know, what's your takeaway from all of the events of today where three police forces have been involved uh, in a case involving one individual? I think it's uh, most uh, unfortunate. It's the theatre of the absurd uh, when the 
actors, the police actors are playing at the behest of their political masters. And I think the start itself was absolutely wrong. You know, if you really look at the case which has been uh, instituted against uh, Bagga, it's, it, it doesn't uh, apply at all, whether the section of 153A, 505, 506, they are just not applicable. In fact, both in the case of Nevani and, and the case of Bagga, it was at best a defamation case. Now, the second point is that the jurisdiction of the case uh, lay in Delhi. Therefore, the case should have been uh, instituted in Delhi, but it was instituted in Punjab. And then the Punjab police came all the way to Delhi to arrest. Uh, if under 41 CRPC, you have given a number of notices and uh, the person does not respond, if the case itself has a punishment less than seven years, why do you need to arrest at all? Because it's, after all, just a statement. You can put up the chashi and, you know, get away with it. Therefore, it's obvious that the political action was predominant in this entire case. And the other thing is it was compounded by Delhi, Delhi police. Uh, when uh, the arrest was made, I, I, I understand that the arrest was actually made. But then another mistake was that the, if the arrest was made, the transit remand was not taken by the magistrate of Delhi. In fact, uh, they just went because they thought that within six hours they reached Mohali and therefore it was not required. And therefore, the action which took place later was another political action, and the whole thing compounded into an actual farce. I'm extremely sad to say that this kind of a circus has not been witnessed for a long, long time. You know, Politicization of the police did, you know, occur. It did start a few decades back. But at such a naked, brazen stage, perhaps rarely seen. So, so do you think it's essentially a case of every state government trying to use the police force as an extension of whatever their political will is? You spoke a short time ago about Mr. Mevani, who was arrested by the Assam police for a statement he made. The same thing has happened with Mr. Bagga. Now, in Mr. Bagga's case, state police from two other states have come in to, quote-unquote, rescue him. Do you think this is a strange situation? And what should police officers do in this case? Do they have no choice but to listen to their political masters? No, no, of course they have a choice. I, I, I agree with you that they are being utilized by the political masters. And let me assure you that there are still 30% of the policemen who, who stand committed to law, who are, who are brave and who are extremely honest. But the point is, in this particular case, first the case was instituted wrongly, and then when it arrived here, the various political elements got into the show. In fact, the very fact that this issue has, you know, jumped out of police hand is shown by the fact that every channel has politicians speaking on the subject. And where the politicians are justifying the police action, because the police action is from their state, and the jurisdiction of, of, uh, of, of that case lies under their domain. And therefore, extremely unfortunate what this has happened. The two states later who got involved, in fact, the Delhi police, which filed an abduction case, was ridiculous. And, and, and the Haryana police, which stopped the uh, uh, Punjab police. I mean, this was a matter. First, it was instituted wrongly, but the other two did know better. And that's why it is proven what you're saying is that it actually happened at the behest of the political masters, which is extremely unfortunate. Now, the next question you've asked me is that, should the policemen allow this? No, they should not. But who's not going to allow it? The chief of the police, the DGP? Then there are other elements in the bureaucracy, like the Home Secretary and the Chief Secretary. But apparently, they all lay supine in this case. They just don't have a say. Because things are happening at the level of SHOs, and they're happening at the level of SPs. And that's why what we are seeing today is a brazen show of political authority. It's not the police cases which have been instituted just. You know, Mr. Azad, you talked about uh, the fact that you have politicians speaking on this issue through the day, and we consciously took a decision not to do that. We wanted to speak to a senior retired police official to understand the rot in the system. Give us some context.
what is the constitutional duty of a law enforcement officer in this country? And is it not first to the citizen? Absolutely. I think uh, you, you hit the nail on the head. The police is, is responsible and is only responsible to the law of the land. The police is meant to serve the public through the law of the land. And therefore, if there is, you know, Justice Ramana, it's a very important thing. Uh, Justice Ramana in a lecture some time back said that the police to be credible before the public, for the police to do uh, correctly to what they owe to the public as a public servant, it is important that there is a distance maintained from the political authority and the police. Why? So that the police can be autonomous, police can take actions, and police cannot be under any pressure. But today what is happening is, unfortunately, and why I talked about the politicians is that, in fact, the entire opposition and the entire the ruling party or the opposition, they are all together in one. That today, when even the police wants to reform itself, even the police wants to reform, they don't want to let it reform. Because let the system continue. The status quo suits everyone. And that is why, unfortunately, this problem, like Namdeet Rana, institution of a sedition case, is absolutely against the law. It's absolutely against the law. Institution of a case against Mevani, institution of a case against Bagga. These are all cases which would be thrown out of the courts if they really look at it seriously. You know, but it will happen as far as the politicization continues. This is, this is what people watching this need to remember. And thank you so much, Mr. Azad, for speaking with us today. It is as if uh, and this formula has been discovered by political parties that you can use your police force like your henchmen and everyone is doing it. All political parties want to do it. They don't want to let go of that power. The police force funded by the taxpayer is there to protect us, the citizen, not to do the bidding of political masters. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Some breaking news coming in. Sri Lanka has declared a state of emergency, giving security forces sweeping powers amidst uh, anti-government protests. Remember, Sri Lanka is right now in a bad situation because of uh, complete bankruptcy and an economic meltdown that the country has been seeing over the last several weeks. Inflation has shot up to high double digits. Uh, essential supplies have run out and the country no longer has any kind of foreign currency. There have been, um, you know, uh, protests going on for several days, including the chant for the Gotabaya uh, uh, administration to completely step down. And now they have declared a state of emergency. Let me go across uh, to Shinjoy Chaudhary for more on this. Shinjoy, was it expected that sooner or later Sri Lanka would declare a state of emergency? Nowhere else for them to turn right now, is it? Yes, undoubtedly, the problem here is uh, that there were these uh, economic measures taken, for instance, the decision not to chemical fertilizers and so on, which completely destroyed the economy. When you stopped using chemical fertilizers, what you do is agricultural uh, production comes down dramatically, tea production comes down dramatically, which is why there are much less exports. Meanwhile, you have stopped all tourism because of COVID. Now, as a result of that, there is no foreign currency. There is no finance. There is no money in Sri Lanka. That's really the important point. And as a result, there have been huge cuts. There, have been in, there has been inflation, of course. There has been huge cuts. There is no fuel. There is no electricity. Naturally, the people are on the streets. There is no choice. Now, a after all this has happened, uh, enormous mismanagement, uh, the, naturally the only recourse to any action was the emergency. How the emergency is going to help, we do not know, because the basic problem of fuel shortage, of electricity shortage, of food shortage, all of those things have to be sorted out. Yeah, that's that's true, Shinjoy, but I, I'm trying to understand what the gambit here uh, is by um, the Rajapaksa administration. What really are they hoping to do? 
uh, by declaring uh, the state of emergency because earlier remember they said that let's form an all party government and the opposition parties in Sri Lanka said we're not having any of it uh, we don't want to get in the middle of this mess and uh, you know sort of um, uh, be um, strung up with all of you guys so how really is it going to help does it bar him any time we don't know actually because the only thing is if you're declaring an emergency you will not have protesters on the streets you will not have people uh, huge mobs all over the streets but at the end of the day uh, there are basic problems that have to be dealt with the shortage of food the shortage of electricity the shortage of fuel all those things have to be sorted out india has been trying to help india has given fuel india has sent food but it's probably not enough because people are furious people are very angry and they want justice they want a return to the life they had the sri lankan economy per capita income was probably better than india's at one point but things have really uh, gone from bad to worse uh, the economy has plummeted there's nothing left in that economy uh, it needs food uh, people need food people need uh, fuel all of which is missing it's a very difficult time in sri lanka so as a result uh, people are in the streets people are violently protesting and the government now has decided to have an emergency now how that will change things we do not know uh, basically the problems will remain right. the fact that there is no cannot be changed by the emergency the fact that there is no fuel cannot be changed by the emergency yes you will not have people on the streets but for how long exactly you will not have people on the streets but for how long the other question is what about the humanitarian crisis that is brewing in this uh, nation this neighboring nation this island nation they've had a situation where they've run out of medicines um, a few weeks ago examinations were cancelled because they didn't have paper they import a lot of what they use and uh, it's believed that their fiscal policies really has led to a lot of this crisis breaking news coming in that uh, sri lanka has now declared a state of emergency which will come into effect from midnight tonight um we i'm going across now to professor asanga who's uh, joining us and just giving us a sense of what this means uh, professor asanga thank you so much for speaking with us here on mirror now uh, tell us what the attempt here is politically to buy time it's a serious crisis uh, which has brewed uh, for the last uh, couple of weeks now it is completely out of control the medicine the basic stuff is not there there's reports that uh, uh, you know one of the fathers who uh, of children who died a lot of things have been reported in social media the villages are also having serious concerns uh, so it spread everywhere uh, to the entire country and it has come to a point uh that is it is completely out of control that is it is moving towards a humanitarian crisis now and uh, what i mentioned about a week ago which is the military coming into the forefront uh, you have all patterns uh, towards that so um uh, a myanmar sort of model uh, is the danger that i see so you know this is uh, the second time in 5 weeks that sri lankan president gotabaya rajapaksa has declared a state of emergency which has given security forces sweeping power the security forces have been given sweeping powers for the second time in 5 weeks so essentially a uh, professor is this to deal with protesters why are the protesters bothering the rajapaksa government so much the very least that people can do is ask for their rights right now the protesters are asking the, for the same uh, basically the demand the main demand is president to step down uh, the reason is uh, the corruption uh, which has been highlighted by the protesters as well as the mismanagement um, so the president rajapaksa and his family basically to step down so the main criteria is that the 22nd of april gazed notification sending the military to all districts it is a serious prior warning sri lanka has not got into a military footing like this uh, basically so it is getting into a situation like myanmar where yes. the military comes into the forefront
Well, um, that truly is worrisome because uh, essentially the government of the day is now using blunt force to push its way instead of looking for quick solutions. Thank you so much, Professor Asanga, for joining us this evening in the middle of so much turmoil in your nation. That's all the time we have on the show. Thank you for joining us on Beyond the Headlines. We'll see you back here next week, same time, same place. Thank you.